Hey, everybody. Can you hear me? Thanks for coming. I thought uh, some of you might have seen some of this work um, already, but I thought it might be fun to present some of it here um, and see if people had opinions or comments or questions. And what I'm really going to talk about today is the result of two different publications which are related to one another, uh, starting with a, a, an assessment for the UN Environment Program and the World Meteorological Organization we were asked to look at the effects of uh, black carbon on climate uh, with regard to whether there are practical approaches to mitigating near-term climate change. And uh, in outlining an integrated assessment that would not just look at climate but air quality impacts, it seemed logical to include ozone at the same time. So we expanded it and looked at both of those together. Uh, and following the production of the assessment, which was done to pretty specific, stringent timelines that UNIP said, uh, we couldn't fit in everything we wanted. So the remainder of the work uh, is in this paper that came out in, in Science just last month. Uh, that really builds on what was in the assessment, which is what we started with. And being a UNEP project, one of the really nice things that, is that they have connections with institutions all over the world. So we were able to get not just a, a group of people from all over the world to help lead this project, but uh, what I'm going to show today is really the work of global modeling done here at GIS and at the Joint Research Center in Italy with the ECHM climate model, uh, emissions, work done by YASA in Austria, a lot of the health impact work was done by the US EPA. Um, the economic analysis, Middlebury College up in Vermont, and a lot of the crop yield analysis, uh, both by the Joint Research Center, uh, again in Italy, and the University of York in the UK. Um, a lot of other people were also involved, and in there's really kind of too many to list here, but you can always look at the documents. All of this stuff is on my web page as well. Let's see if this So, just to kind of reiterate what I said before, what we really wanted to do in this assessment was to see if there were practical measures you could take that would, would have benefits for both the issues of global climate change and for air quality. And what I really mean by that is, you know, there were numerous suggestions in the literature, including things like Jim's paper from around, I think, a decade ago in PNAS, where he talked about an alternative scenario. And one of the ways he got a lower degree of global climate warming was by pulling out black carbon and pulling out some of the other short lived substances. And Mark Jacobson at Stanford had some nice papers about this too, but I mean, when, you, when you really think about it, you cannot wave a magic wand and get rid of black carbon always emitted with other substances. And so knowing what black carbon does to climate on its own tells you almost nothing about what you can practically do. Methane does tend to be emitted on its own, but again, you can't wave a magic wand and have you know, all the sources go away. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine something like a transition to 100% clean energy, but it's maybe even harder to imagine something like a transition to a world where we no longer have any cattle or we no longer grow rice. We don't have ways to control the emissions or to eliminate the emissions from many sources of methane, but especially things like agriculture. We, the world is, the demand for food is just going to keep going up and not down. So it really doesn't help you that much to know what in kind of the uh, idealized case, if you were to remove a particular pollutant, you know, what would happen. What we really wanted to know and what UNEF was asked to tell policymakers was were there practical steps that could be taken today? So with current technology that's already proven and that would have a, a benefit both for air quality and for climate. And so YASA, this, this institute in Austria, um, has assembled a database they call GAINS, which has thousands of different emission control measures where different measures have been put in place somewhere in the world and measurements have been taken afterwards to see what effects they have on pollutants. So you might have something like a tighter regulation on 
fuel used in a particular kind of vehicle, or you might have a particular kind of change to agricultural practices or you know, things like this. Nearly anything that controls emissions of pollutants is good for <coughs> air quality. At least that's our general assumption. There aren't a lot of things that get thrown out of industrial or fossil fuel combustion or biofuel combustion that are actually good to breathe in. Right? So the, the default assumption was that pretty much anything is going to be good for air quality. All of the matters would be here, but how many of them overlap with things that mitigate warming? And there are also things that would be way over here Things that purely reduce CO2 have no direct effect on air quality. But those, uh, what we wanted to find was what's the subset where they overlap. So we use GWP, the global warming potential of all the different pollutants, and screened all of the thousands of measures in the, in the GAINS database to find out which ones would be the most worthy of further study. And what we came up with was a set of uh, emission measures, well, really two sets. One that primarily looked at methane, and these have to do, um, about two-thirds of the, the measures have to do with extraction and transport of fossil fuels. And so that's primarily natural gas, oil, and coal operations. There are also a, a section, about 10% of the reduction, or 10% of the current methane can be reduced due to improved practices in waste management, uh, municipal waste, landfills, and wastewater, with municipal being the largest. And so that primarily involves diverting organics before they ever get into the waste stream. So, you know, here in New York, we recycle glass and paper and metal and plastic, but not organics. Some cities, they do recycle the organics. They never get into the landfills at all. You can also capture methane from landfills, but if you divert before it even gets into the waste stream, you have a big effect on methane uh, coming out of landfills. Agriculture, well, this is the one I mentioned, it's, it's pretty hard to deal with. So you could get some reduction, but agriculture is a pretty big source of methane. It's maybe half the methane, and you can only get about 5% uh, reduction. But there are a few things you can do there. So these are the methane measures. The picture, by the way, shows a visible spectrum view of a methane or a natural gas storage tank, and then an infrared spectrum with a little handheld infrared camera. So of course this is why it's a greenhouse gas, right? Because it's absorbing in the infrared. But you can also see how much is just pouring out of these old tanks. Do, are these numbers on the sector themselves or the total? Sorry, this is a, the impact of the measure on the total methane total budget. So a quarter of the, uh, I'll show the, the totals again in a minute, but a quarter of the, Methane can be reduced by the fossil fuel measures. That's what that means. And so a lot of these things, you know, there's been a bunch of debate recently, even with, with things like from the fossil fuel industry, like this shows. A lot of it's not really measured very well. A lot of it's not reported. There's a whole debate now with fracking and what's the impact of fracking. Well, it really depends on how much is coming out, and people don't know very well. That picture makes it seem like it's not unmeasurable. <laughs> Sorry, say again. That picture makes it seem like it's not unmeasurable. <laughs> yeah, no, it doesn't seem like it should be so bad. But for some of these things, I think there's certainly a, a reluctance on the part of industry to either take the data in the first place or tell anybody what the data is. So industry usually complain, uh, claims for something like fracking now very, very low. Usually <laughs> below a percent. And when uh, NOAA scientists recently flew in Colorado downwind of the, of the uh, drilling fields, they came up with much, much higher methane. And places like Wyoming have ozone exceedance problems. I mean, there's not a lot of pollutant sources in, in Wyoming. It's not, you know, the East Coast. So I think there really is a problem. And it looks like it's not small. So it's, uh, and not unmetrable. So the EPA is working on draft rules to make improve the measurements, but right now they're not required. Most of that, it's not reported. Uh, uh, BC measures are the other half of the set we came up with. Uh, I call them BC measures, but really, you know, they affect a whole bunch of different pollutants. We always get organic carbon along with the black carbon. 
you get a lot of carbon monoxide along with it, so this is why it's linked to ozone, even if, you, if you're only worried about aerosols, you're still going to get an ozone signal, whether you're accounting for it or not. Uh, so you might as well, in some cases, you're affecting NOx, sulfur, or some of the other pollutants. But the main ones are BCOC and CO. And these are things like diesel trucks. Um, coal briquettes are still used for, or, or coal is still used for residential heating in China and parts of Eastern Europe. Replacing those. Um, this is a, up in northern countries. You know, residential wood burning is still popular in many places. Cook stoves is, is one of the, the big things, and cook stoves especially have a higher organic carbon fraction um, than something like diesel. So that's, a, that's one where you can really be led astray if you only think of the black carbon and forget the co emittance. Um, so replacing these kind of cook stoves is certainly not an easy thing, but that's another one of the measures that we came up with. And if you look at all of these, uh, and look at the different emissions here, you can see some interesting things. Um, the block carbon measures, these, no, I can't remember if I had seven or nine on the, on the earlier slide, but anyway, these small subset of measures can pull out most of the block carbon. So the first bar in all of these is the projected change from the present out of 30 <coughs> years, and the next is the effect of these measures. So black carbon is being controlled in some places, going up in others, the net change is near zero. And the reference scenario, you can have a really very, very large impact <coughs> on these, through these measures. Comparable <coughs> size impact on organic carbon. Down here you also take out you also take out a large fraction of the of the yeah. carbon monoxide. Um, you have smaller effects on NOx. You have almost no effect on sulfur. That's the reference, and that's the. Uh, yeah, maybe that's better. Thank you. So you have almost no effect on sulfur from these measures, and down here, <coughs> CO2. You have almost no effect on CO2 from these measures either. Uh, here's the methane, by the way. Methane emissions are projected to go up under a reference scenario. It's based on the International Energy Agency. That's primarily increased exploitation of natural gas around the world, um, which you know, we've already seen over the last decade. That seems quite robust if it goes up you know, another 25%. When you impose these controls, you get a reduction of about 20% or so. And that, relative to the reference, is then about a 40% reduction, because that's where those numbers came from. So the fossil fuels are about 25% of this 40, the waste management is 10, and agriculture is 5. So you can't make, with existing technological approaches, you can't make as large of a dent in the methane emissions as you can in the carbon emissions, the black carbon. Uh, but you can still make a pretty large, large dent. And as I was pointing out in the last slide, there's not much overlap between the impact of these measures and controls on CO2 or on sulfur. And so CO2 measures, if you really want to get rid of the CO2, your largest sources are power plants and large industrial sources. <coughs> Those have such efficient combustion that they tend to emit very, very little black organic carbon. You know, it's a product of incomplete combustion, so there's still soot coming out. That doesn't happen so much. Uh, not that measurements are necessarily adequate for this, but it, it doesn't happen so much to the best of our knowledge in these very high temperature emission power plants. Um, so the methane in BC are targeting other sectors, quite different. Transportation really does emit a substantial bit of both, but what we looked at were control strategies to deal with that problem. So these are the kind of things that the US has put in place, that Europe has put in place, Japan. They're if you imagined a world where, say, we switch to electric cars or you know, more public transportation, something really more dramatic, which you would probably need to achieve CO2 targets that are quite ambitious, like, let's say, 80% reduction. You know, you're not going to do that without, with just power and industry. You're going to have to turn to transport as well. Then you would, of course, affect the uh, short route as well. 
But in the near term, the next 20 years or so, it's likely that these kind of measures on short-lived pollutants will be very different from measures on long-term pollutants. Okay, when we have all of these measures chosen, we know the kind of things we're going to look at. Now we're going to talk about what the impacts would be of implementing these actual measures. So what we did in the assessment to begin was to use the absolute global temperature potential. So this is a, a metric that's fairly widely used now in the literature, um, rather than the global warming potential, which is the integrated radiative forcing out over time. The global temperature potential brings in the temperature response based on exponential fits to full climate models. So it just gives you a pretty simple uh, relationship. If you don't have the A, then it's the global temperature potential, which is the, t the impact on temperature relative to CO2. That's what's most widely used. The A, the absolute, means you're just not dividing by the impact of CO2. So what it's giving you is a delta T per teragram of emission of any point. Uh, so it's a shorthand, a simple shorthand to get the climate impact at any point in time uh, from a particular number or amount of emissions. What we did in the assessment was we, we had two models, we had GIS and ECHM, looked at the impact of all those measures I just showed you, all the methane measures, all of the BC measures, turned into gridded inventories, put into both the models, the 3D models run. We didn't necessarily want to base our results just on those two 3D models. So what we did was look at the percent of the anthropogenic forcing that was reduced by those measures. And then we multiply that by our best estimate based on all of the literature, not just those two models of what the real forcing was. So for example, let's say the BC measures took out 70% of the anthropogenic uh, black carbon forcing. Rather than use whatever these two models happened to give us, we looked through all the literature and we found things like, well, most of the models underestimate BC um, in comparison with observations over places like South Asia. <coughs> so when we have the mean result from all the models, or any two models, we adjusted that upwards to account for this underestimate with respect to observations and came up with a, a, an assessed value of what really the best estimate was and a range of uncertainties for black carbon. So we assessed for black carbon the direct effect, semi-direct effect, indirect impacts, um, for methane, it's pretty easy because the greenhouse gas impact directly has very small uncertainties. The ozone impact does have some uncertainties, but those, again, can be assessed in the literature. <coughs> What's trickier is the aerosol indirect effects for other aerosols. And what we found was that uh, we didn't really find any results in the literature ascribing indirect effects due to individual components of aerosols. So we made a very simple assumption, which was that um, sulfate is more soluble than organic. So we would put assign the best estimate of total indirect effect, I'd say a satellite-based <coughs> estimate. You can see an aerosol cloud relationship. It doesn't tell you which type of aerosol. It only tells you the total aerosol. So we assign that to sulfate. That's a very crude assumption, but there was really nothing to go by in the literature. So this is one of the caveats where I think it's important to recognize that there's a large degree of uncertainty when it comes to the black and organic carbon <coughs> because of having to make assumptions like this. <coughs> so to our surprise, the uh, aerosol forces actually came out to be almost the same calculated two models. Uh, the the ECHO model is internally mixed aerosols, the GIST model is externally mixed. So it's not, I mean, they're really fundamentally doing things very differently, and, and yet they got the same answer. So maybe it's somewhat of a coincidence. Um, but anyway, given that we took the uncertainty range from the literature, hopefully that, that dealt with that problem so, somewhat. Ozone is very nonlinear. The chemical response depends on the background state, so there it's not that surprising really we got some differences in the results. We put those two results together, took the mean value, took the uncertainty, 
and looked at using the AGTP what the temperature impact would be. So on the right here, these are uncertainty ranges for 2070 for these four lines. This is the GIST data set for historical temperatures. And this is where the temperature goes on the reference. Mm -hmm. This is imposing CO2 measures, which take you to a 450 part per million uh, CO2 world at 2100. So you know, kind of typical control scenario. These are the impact of the methane and BC measures, and this is both sets put together. So you can see a couple of interesting things here. One is that the CO2 measures actually <coughs> cause the, the volume to exceed the reference case slightly uh, in the near term, and that's because one of the you know, key ways to control CO2 is to reduce coal burning. Reducing coal burning reduces the sulfur that comes along with it. So you actually have a short-term uh, disbenefit but of course, in the long term, you know, the slope is much lower in this one than it is in the reference case. If you look at the impact of the methane and BC measures, these are assumed to be phased in from 2010 to 2030, so the next 20 years. You have a large benefit during this time period. And then afterwards, you know, as you might expect, you just go back on the trajectory being controlled by CO2. So they end up at almost the exact same point, but notice that the slope is wildly different. If you haven't dealt with carbon dioxide, you haven't really got yourself much of much gain out here because you're on this same slope of really rapidly increasing. We shaded in the area above two, which is you know the nominal target, what the world is aiming for. 1.5 is what many countries would like. Uh, you don't ha really have any hope of keeping below two even in the short time frame here, which only goes out to 2070, with either one of these sets alone, with both the short-term and long-term measures, you have a hope of keeping below 2C at least through the next 60 years. Joe, do you know where you end up if you have CO2 and methane? Mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry. Do you know where you end up if you only do the CO2 and the methane? If you only do CO2 and methane? Um, yes, well, so I'll show it in, in a bit that the difference between these two lines, the methane and BC, the methane has a larger signal. So the methane is probably about two-thirds of that. So you would end up, you know, you'd have the CO2 curve plus two-thirds of the way down to here. It'd probably be pretty close to two, around 1.9. So this, this was kind of our uh, signature graphic to summarize what we had done in the UNEP assessment. And we've all taken to, uh, to calling this the t-shirt graph. Um, this sort of happened because so Al Gore had this thing last year with this 24 hours of reality show where he had people a uh, web streaming event and he had different people come in and talk and scientists came and celebrities <coughs> came and all kinds of different people. And one of the people that came actually wore a t-shirt where he had this graph made into a shirt and showed that it's on TV. So this is now a t-shirt graph which everybody did. He's a composer. But he likes he likes science. <laughs> so that's the most kind of popularized one. There's a lot more detail in the assessment, most of which I won't go into, but I will just say that we also tried to look at the regional differences uh, in a very limited extent using these regional temperature potentials, which give you the response um, in different latitude bands. And so this is the southern hemisphere, extra tropics, the global mean and the tropics are pretty much on top of each other, the northern hemisphere, mid latitudes and the Arctic. And what you can see is that when you apply the methane measures, the whole world is you know, not that different, one region from another. When you add in the black carbon measures, then you really start to separate the uh, northern hemisphere. Sorry, this is the mid-latitudes and the Arctic, I think, together, and the southern hemisphere, because most of the aerosols are in the northern hemisphere. So that's when you really start to see the difference. You also see that the error bars, which here are fairly small, Primarily, the error bars there come from uncertainty in climate sensitivity, 
rather than enforcing, uh, they get much, much larger when you add in the block carbon measures. And here you see the same kind of thing I showed before, the disbenefit early on, again, primarily in the northern hemisphere, because that's where the aerosols are from controlling CO2, um, and then later on, strong benefits. One other point we tried to be very clear about was the relationship between controlling short <coughs> pollutants and controlling CO2. So one of the initial reactions some people have to seeing the earlier graph <coughs> is, oh look, the warming is less here than it is here. So this is great. All we have to do is, is deal with short lived pollutants. And in fact, some people from a Toyota research company came to my office and they said, this is really interesting work. We're really interested in all the black carbon stuff. Does this mean we don't have to limit CO2 for 10, 20 more years? This would be great. Um, so we wanted to let people know that there's really a lot to think about when you talk about these and try to consider trading one with another because they're really operating at very different time scales. And when you use any of these metrics like GWP or GDP, and you have to pick a point in time to compare them, but really they have impacts that are stretching on across time in different ways. So this graph attempts to shed some light on this, this issue of the trade-off in time. And this shows the same reference curve and the same impact of the near-term measures um, but then it adds in one more, which is the near-term measures, but delayed. And so what you can see is that as you get out further and further in time, the near impact of the near-term measures delayed versus the impact of the near-term measures put in right away is not very different. In fact, as you get out further in time, that it's negligible. So what it's saying is that the long term, you know, as long as you put these measures into place at some point, you assume the world eventually takes air pollution very seriously, cleans up the air for the sake of public health, then what's really going to determine the peak temperature is what you do to CO2. As long as it happens sometime before the peak, the short-lived pollutants they have no influence on the maximum temperature. So if you're worried about something like peak temperature for destabilizing the ice sheets or something, short-lived are not the way to trim the peak temperature. Why is the reference line so straight? You would also, uh, I would expect it also to, to curve up. The reference? Way. Yes. Well, it's a fair, I think it does curve up if you go up to further times. Um, it's a, especially if you, yeah. so if you show the record and then the extrapolation, it's like the record just, yes, yeah, sort of waves and then the Extrapolation is like straight up. Yeah, well, so the record, of course, includes things like variations mm -hmm. in you know, natural forcings and uh, unforced variability, but also things like sulfur emissions going way up in North America, Europe, and down. Mm -hmm. the reference scenario is pretty simple assumptions, and it's almost all due to just CO2 steadily going up. In other words. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a much steadier behavior. And of course, there's no noise and there's no natural. Um, what Yasa felt was that for CO2, they and, and others certainly have made very long-term projections and that that's a sensible thing to do because much of the infrastructure is uh, consists of things that last a very long time. So if you project how many power plants are built over the next 30 years, you know, those will last for a century and will give you some reasonable handle on CO2 emissions, even out of, say, 2100. But projecting what's happening with short-lived species at 2100 requires knowing you know, how many people are using biomass truck stoves in 2099, right? We don't have a lot of skill at projecting socioeconomics that far out in advance. So they were very uncomfortable providing any emissions past say 24. So the short-lived pollutants all have no changes in the reference or the mitigation scenarios past 2040 because they figured it was just all being random guesswork anyway and what's useful. So that's another reason the reference is then very smooth. But this, I mean, the, the key point here is that 
dealing with the short-lived pollutants gives you a nice benefit early on. And this benefit could even give you some long-term benefit by avoiding things that have a long-term impact, like say, release of carbon from the thawing permafrost. Right? If the warming rate is slowed, I mean, it's still warming in this scenario, but it's not warming as much. And so that can affect long-lived species as well, and you know, there can be some long-term benefit. But primarily, this is a way to achieve near-term end. And to achieve long-term climate benefits, you really need to target the long-lived things. I would also point out that for the ice sheets, doing the, doing the near-term stuff earlier will cause you know, less melting every year as we go forward, according to that graph. So that actually could be a long-term benefit. Yeah. So I mean, there, there are feedbacks which, in this kind of calculation, which has an AGTP number assigned to each um, teragram of emission for each, each gas or aerosol product. Know, there's no treatment of those kind of feedbacks. So there could be more nuanced things where you know, the ice albedo feedback. No, I'm not talking about feedback. I'm, I'm talking about you know, the amount of ice that melts is basically you know, a threshold function of, the, of how much the temperature is above a certain temperature. And so if you, so, so the total amount that will melt by uh, 2070 is equal to you know, something like the integral under that curve. If you've just lowered the whole curve, you, you're melting less ice now, total. Yeah. Yeah. So I, there's a lot of different impacts that are, uh, I think, a bit lost in the simple shorthand of showing low maintenance. Yeah. Ecosystems probably also care much more about the rate of change. And so people have talked about <coughs> metrics being more appropriately based on things like the rate or the integral under the curve. I mean, that's what you have to adapt to is not the temperature at any one point in time, but how it's the pathway that's getting you there. So I think that is that's something I, I don't know of how to take, how to quantify that sort of benefit. I think that's a real benefit. You, now that you mentioned the ecosystems, how have you handled deforestation? Have we done what? Sorry. Yeah, the, the deforestation. Uh, we we haven't, haven't treated it at all. So everything is stable? Everything is increasing with the, the scenario? What's happening? No, there's no change to any any ecosystems or any carbon fluxes associated with forest so, so all that kind of stuff. I mean, this isn't even a climate model. Right? This is just an emission scenario multiplied by an AGTP for each regional. So it's, it's very simple. I will show you something slightly better in a moment. In fact, this one is the first one from a slightly better calculation. So what we did in the follow-up work, which is what's um, much more covered in the science paper than the, than the assessment, is run the GIS, the new model, into uh, like a slab ocean. So E2S, that's called, rather than E2R or E2H. This shows one of the fields from that, which is the change in the black carbon albedo forcing. Um, and what you can see here is that so when black carbon, or even organic to a very small extent, lands on snow and ice, it changes, it gets stays on the surfaces when it's deposited and, and reduces the reflectivity. And so in the global mean, that gives you a pretty small radiated forcing. But regionally, it can be very large. And so you see the regions where you have impacts on a broad scale is primarily the high latitudes, especially the Arctic. But the region where you have the, the very largest forcing amount is here in the Himalayas, where you have snow and ice, you have a lot of sunlight, and you are very close to all the South Asian sources. And so in some of these places, you can get you know, this blue, dark blue color bar is two to four watts per meter. So it's a really, really large radiative forcing um, on a regional on a regional basis. And so that we were able, you know, you can't get things like that with AGTP with any of these global metrics, but these come from a full model. The other thing we tried to look at in the full model, um, well initially we looked at the change in atmospheric forcing, which is the difference between surface and top of the atmosphere forcing, so how much heat is being deposited into the atmosphere through absorption by primarily by black carbon. 
And this shows the uh, present day climatology of atmospheric forcing in the ECHO model, the GIST model, and in a, a semi empirical um, estimate mm -hmm. from Chongin Ramanathan based on, on satellite data uh, combined with, with some model. So this is just to show that the two models, ECHM seems to be a little bit lower than GIST, and both are a little bit lower, but not too far off from, um, from the, the semi-empirical estimate in most areas. I mean, there are places like here in Latin America where it seems like maybe our emission inventories are, are substantially too low. Um, dust certainly can also play a role. So you see these big things off the Sahara. Uh, which can be somewhat different, and you know you see more or you see less absorption in some of these areas than you do in the semi-empirical. But that could be dust and contamination over Asia. It's all a little bit difficult to tell. But the the main point is that they're they seem to be kind of in the ballparks. And this is the reduction in atmospheric forcing due to the measures. So you see it has hardly any effect over North America or Europe um, or Japan because our emissions are already. What it does do is lower the emissions quite a lot if you put these measures into place in developing countries in Africa and in Asia. This is as far as we went in the assessment, but in the in the uh, GIST climate runs, we were actually able to look at the full 3D models. Change in rainfall is the top, and the change in surface temperature. And so this is again from this is the E2S uh, simulations. All the measures put into place. The change in rainfall in uh, um, the changes on the left side are due to both black carbon and methane measures, and the changes on the right side are due to just the methane measures. And one of the little uh, visual tricks I did here is the scale is almost exact is exactly double on the left side compared to the right side, and the forcing is not quite exactly but almost exactly double as well. And so you get a half the forcing from the methane measures. And then you roughly double the forcing when you add in the BC measures. So if the response was proportional to the forcing, you'd see the exact same colors on both sides. What you see is that, in fact, when you add in the black carbon measures, you now see these very large changes in rainfall, which you don't see over here in response to a long-lived greenhouse gas. So while we all know that things like a doubled CO2 world has changes in rainfall patterns. Proportional to the applied radiative forcing, these absorbing aerosols give you a far, lar far larger change in rainfall pattern. And that may be both because they are unevenly distributed as well as this ab absorption of short wave radiation. What you see are things like it really perturbs the monsoon, so you get a, a large shift in rainfall between Southeast Asia and the, the Himalayan foothills. You also see this drying, uh, well, in this case, avoided drying of the Sahel, because the aerosols are causing a drying of the Sahel. So when you remove them, you start to get that rainfall back. And that's a, that one is actually a fairly robust result across even the AR4 models. And much of this drying in this region has been linked to aerosols. Uh, why have you masked the ocean? Um, just because what we were really interested in was rainfall on land, where it impacts agriculture. So it's clearer to see when we, when we just last yeah. yeah. up. Things do yeah. And for the temperature changes, you know, again, there's much, there's more stronger <coughs> regional structure. Both of these have some polar amplification, like you always see, but you see things like a bit of the Himalayas starting to stand out and extra warming here uh, in the Arctic, exactly where you have this enhanced effect from the albedo forcing. So I think we haven't really, with just one model, been able to, to very closely think the regional pattern of forcing to the responses yet. But we're seeing that, that it's regionally inhomogeneous forcing from black carbon, also from ozone, are giving you stronger responses in many of the northern hemisphere regions than is the methane forcing. So the regional response is, is somewhat decoupled, or at least not directly proportional to the global mean. Now you can go back to the measures. Once you know the impact of the methane measures as a whole,
you can divide those up into basically as much detail as you want because em emissions of methane from any place or source have the same impact as any other. So you can go through and figure out not just which measures are the best, but which places and which measures and really provide that kind of detail that you would need to, to optimize policy. So you can th see things like this orange color as coal mining, which in China uh, is emitting enormous amounts of methane. So that's a really, like, uh, a really large sector, region by sector, to target. Whereas, you know, in the United States, we already, U.S. Go, right? in the U.S., I mean, we already control methane emissions from coal mines pretty well. So, I mean, we, uh, that just reinforces the idea we know how to do this. We mine a ton of coal in the U.S. also, but we don't have a lot of methane emissions. So it's not because China is mining so much more coal than everywhere else. It's just because they haven't been kind of applying this technology. And Russia is where the gas, the gas pipelines lead. So that's this yellow one, which doesn't really show up anywhere else very much. And again, we know how to do this. We know how to monitor gas leaks and such. It's just not, not done in Russia. And you can see that even places like the US, here it's municipal waste is the biggest. So you can really provide this kind of level of detail Unfortunately, you can't do that so easily with the, with the black carbon measures. Because these measures emit black organic and carbon monoxide, as I've said, but also those pollutants have different impacts in different regions. They're soluble, they, you know, they don't last so long, they get washed out somewhere. Uh, they, they can be emitted in India in the wet season and get washed out the next day, emitted in the dry season, last a long time. You know, the location, the time of the year, everything really matters. So it's much trickier. OK, I'm going to go on to the other impacts, the air quality impacts. I won't go into great detail, but we use the model uh, from Ekam and GIS, the surface PM 2.5 and the ozone. And we did health and crop yield uh, impact <coughs> assessments for all these measures using concentration and response relationships from the literature. So this is these are available for human mortality due to ozone and PM2.5, and for yield of several different staple crops for ozone. This is just an example, so you see that this is you know, a real thing. You put a filter on air in a corn, uh, uh, sorry, wheat, a wheat plant in Pakistan versus ambient air. And there's a huge difference, because ozone really damages the plant's ability to grow. And that's you know, the kind of air that you have in plenty of cities in the developing world. So these are the impacts, trying to put several of these on a kind of common framework so you can compare them all. Climate change in terms of global mean avoided warming in degree C. Human health impacts, food security in terms of avoided uh, crop losses due to ozone. And you can see some interesting things here. This, this goes to this, this question of how much is due to methane and how much is due to BC. So the methane measures are giving you a lot uh, by, sorry, the left bar in each case is methane measures alone. The right is adding in the BC measures. The methane measures are giving you almost 0.3 and the BC another roughly 0.2. The uncertainty, again, is much, much larger for the BC measures than it is for the methane measures. But it's you know sort of in the ballpark of a comparable magnitude. When you get to the human health effects, there is a noticeable benefit for methane, but the effect of ozone on mortality is much, much weaker than the effect of particulate. And so the benefits from uh, avoided mortalities, you know, it's, it's two or three million people a year, it's quite a large number, but it's almost exclusively from the black carbon measures, not from the methane measures. So they have more certainty when it comes to their global mean climate benefit, which have a lot more certainty of getting a, a big health benefit when it comes to black carbon. Food security is roughly evenly divided because the methane gives you a clear ozone reduction and the black carbon measures primarily via carbon monoxide also give you a pretty clear ozone reduction. To kind of summarize all of the benefits in perspective, the methane measures, large benefits globally and for agriculture, human health small, virtually certain all of the different impacts. For BC, probably a large global climate benefit, but there really is a large uncertainty, primarily due to the air 
first of all, indirect effects for both BC and the co-emitted organic carbon. Um, there is, so, though, the substantial, substantial regional climate benefits. There you don't have, you know, when I showed the map of the perturbed regional rainfall over the Sahel or over South Asia, there you don't have the, the offsetting impact of black and organic carbon. So even if they cancel out in the global mean, the black is strongly absorbing and the organic is not having a big impact on the atmospheric forcing, which seems to be what's governing those perturbations to the traditional rainfall patterns. So you have, it, ironically, in some <coughs> of more certainty in the smaller scale regional changes than you do in the global mean. The same is true with the high latitudes, where you look at what the impact on the Arctic, and you have black and organic carbon together, which may be canceling somewhat at the global mean, but over a very high albedo surface up in the Arctic, the black is, has an even stronger effect because of the contrast with the, with the bright ground cover. And the organic has very little effect because it's already very reflective. So again, you have more uncertainty in the, in the regional climate benefits than in the global benefits of the black carbon measures, especially for water and cryosphere uh, rather than temperature. And you have very large health benefits high confidence in the regional climate and air quality benefits, higher than the global mean. <coughs> the last uh, real kind of result I was going to show is some maps we made of the, the spatial patterns of the temperature change. This is from the GIS climate model runs, the premature mortality country by country, and the crop yield improvements country by country. So you can see that the spatial distribution of, of all three of these is rather different. But the temperatures tending to give you higher responses at, at higher latitudes in many cases, and where the snow and ice albedo it forcing is large. Uh, part of that is, of course, just due to climate sensitivity being larger at higher latitudes. The avoided mortalities are then a function both of the PM changes and the population. So you see countries like Nigeria or India with very large populations jumping out. But I mean, there's some pretty clear differences between various countries that have large populations. Uh, but South Asia and Central Africa really stand out in premature mortalities. Now when you turn to crop yields, you see that it's actually pretty much the, the uh, <coughs> relatively less cloudy subtropics that stand out. That's where you get the most sunlight that can really consistently come in and form ozone. And so you see this band from Mexico then across into the eastern Mediterranean and the Middle East, um, where you have these clear skies and you get the biggest ozone impact. It's also a function, of course, of how much uh, <coughs> well, no, that's, that's it. Let me just show you one other thing we made. This one back here. I should actually say. We also made some graphics so people could find out what their country did. And if you want to see, you know, what's the warming over Canada, you just put the cursor over and it and it tells you. So we have these for all of these different impacts, partially because we couldn't figure out a way to put all of the numbers in any sort of user-friendly format. Um, either it would be a, we have something like 192 countries and we have impacts on temperature and precipitation and crop yields and agriculture and four different kinds of crops. And it's just too much information. But these I, I seem to have been very much appreciated by uh, the policy community. Okay. The last thing that we showed in the paper was a, a summary of the physical impacts. So this is all the, the stuff that I've showed before. The climate, uh, sorry, the climate, the crop yield, and the premature mortality benefits, this time by methane measures, by a subset of BC technical and regulatory measures. For your crop yields, did you include the changes in precipitation? So I imagine some, some for, region, for the crop yields, did you include the changes in precipitation? No. On the no. So there are changes in temperature and precipitation, which of course have, have the potential to have substantial additional benefits because you're absorb, avoiding a lot of shifts. But we did, we were not yet able to quantify that. Yet. We hope to be able to do that sometime, but um, certainly be on my my levels. But
the University of York people thought that maybe they could do that at some point. So this is, yeah, so this is just due to ozone and the premature, yeah, the premature, de premature deaths are also not including any climate related, say, change in heat waves or something like that. So these are kind of the same sets of numbers we saw before, but then the second step we did was to put evaluation on these. And one of the things that's interesting about that is to compare the benefit of the avoided climate change with the agriculture or human health benefits. And so you can see for methane, the health and the climate are kind of in the same ballpark. Um, for the black carbon measures, the health benefits tend to dwarf any of the others because there's so many lives affected by those. Now these are really challenging to do these kind of benefits. Um, there's a lot of ethical issues raised in valuing avoided mortalities around the world. Uh, we did these in a couple different ways. We used the same value of a human life anywhere in the world as a kind of most uh, equitable way of, of valuing lives, um, trying to avoid people being upset that people in poorer countries were worth less. Um, but we also did do a valuation where the valuation is tied to income levels. Because certainly the, the way that lives are valued, say in the United States, where the EPA is required to do these kind of analyses, um, when they promote any kind of regulation, they have to give the valuation and the cost and the benefits. And the benefits have to include the effect on a human life. So they have to figure out how much a life is worth. And one of the ways they do is they ask people. Another way is they, you know, how much would you pay to avoid dying two years early? You know? and another one is they look at, the, at a job that's more dangerous, where the average life lost is you know, two years of life lost compared to a, a job that is basically the same job but not as dangerous. What's the pay differential that gets people to take the more dangerous job? And all these kind of things. So it's all of those are tied to income level. So you could argue that that really is the most simple way to do things, even though it's then vastly unfair that an American or a European is worth way more than somebody in the developed world. So anyway, they have large uncertainties on these numbers, like you know, three, three trillion plus or minus. Well, about three trillion. <laughs> um, a large part of that is due to how you do the valuation. But even if you take the low end of these numbers, you know, it's still over a trillion dollars. So it's huge numbers. For methane, it's especially interesting because you remember that since the methane emissions are all equivalent, you can also do this by ton. So these numbers in the second column here are by ton. And then the climate benefit, a couple thousand dollars per ton, agriculture small, health benefit another thousand per ton. So you come out with numbers that are you know, in the thousands of dollars per ton as the benefits. And then when you look at the abatement costs, most all of the measures we looked at are under $250 a ton. A lot of them are under $100 a ton. So these pay for themselves typically more than 10 times over. A typical problem that's always the case in these kind of things is that, say, the person who owns the gas tank or the transmission line or the coal mine is the one that pays the implementation costs, whereas everybody across society receives the benefits. So yes, costs, benefits drastically outweigh the cost, but not for the person paying the cost. So I will conclude with telling you, I, I think there are three more here. One is just to include the science here, the identified measures. What the message we were trying to really get at was that the were identified measures with current, that are currently in use. All the technology is there. This is not something like carbon capture and sequestration, which has a very nice appeal to it, but hasn't been done at scale. These are all things that have been done. They just haven't been done everywhere yet. So if we widely and rapidly implemented these, there are a lot of benefits that I think we have high confidence we could achieve, and many of these achieve uh, cost savings. So we put that out. And there's actually been a response. Um, just two weeks ago, the United States and five other nations launched the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Um, Hillary Clinton made the presentation with Lisa Jackson, the head of the EPA, and the ministers and the environment from the other countries. 
And in her remarks, she directly tied to uh, the kind of things we're saying. UDEP has determined reducing a pollutants can slow global warming by up to a half a degree. So unless George made a typo in his program, she was right. Hopefully, hopefully we didn't make a mistake then. Um, and she really went on to talk about how this was really the, the package of measures that we talked about, that every one of these has been applied. You know, all of the, all of the text really is based on what we said, and they seem to really get the idea. When you put all these factors together, they add up to an important opportunity that we cannot miss. So something is happening. They've committed between foundations, the US, Canada, $30 million so far. They have some other countries that hopefully will join, um, and this will go somewhere. We will see. The reaction has been mixed but mostly favorable, the Times said nice things, like a second front in the climate wars, and this good, some, some way to move ahead. Uh, the BBC was one of the places which, which noted the, the worry that some scientists have that this short-term climate fix, fix risks blanking CO2. And this is the one kind of backlash we've had occasionally. People say, oh, well, you shouldn't even say, say anything about these, because then people are just going to forget about CO2. They'll think this is the way to go. So in, in Secretary Clinton's remarks, she specifically pointed this out, that this was not the case. This was complementary to, not supplementary to, or not a supplement for. Um, we pointed that out in the UNEP report and in the assessment. And I, and I think that this is a kind of a, a bit of a red herring. I mean, it's, it reminds me of like you think of somebody going into the doctor who's just who's got a broken leg and has cancer, and the doctor's saying, oh, cancer's much more serious. In the long term, that's all that matters. So we're not going to fix the broken leg. <laughs> I mean, you can do two things. So it's important, I think, to realize that this is not a substitute for CO2. But I think that this is a good thing to do along with CO2. And of course, you have the whole unfortunate situation that we're not actually getting anywhere with CO2. So you could put all of your effort and time and energy into dealing with CO2 and end up, end up not getting anywhere on either, which would put you even worse off than you are now. And of course, all the people that, whose lives are saved by the air quality aspect of these, if you only concentrate on CO2, well, then that's two, three million people here dying uh, that don't have to die if you clean up the air quality. So I think that there's, I'm happy that there's been policy world uptake of this. And of course, now it remains to be seen whether they'll actually get anything done. So I've gone a full hour, but if anybody has more questions, I'm happy to take them. <laughs> your graph seems to show that the, the, policy, the policy people that need to respond to this are largely in Africa and Asia. Uh, so you know, how much progress is it to get, you know, the U.S. Department of State in Canada on board? Well, so what I think can be the role of developed countries, so the partnership is three developing nations and three developed thus far. Uh, so Bangladesh and Ghana and one more there's good. Mexico are the three developed. So there's, there's, you're right, there's, and for methane there are things we can do in the developed world. But most of the measures, and virtually all of the VC measures, are in the developing world. We but there, what we can do is give some money for some of these. Yeah. Right. So I mean, something like the landfill gas capture. When you put a ca you put a capture technology on a landfill, you capture the methane coming out, you use it instead of some other fossil fuel source, and that can pay back for it itself over say <coughs> ten years. But a city in India or Pakistan doesn't have the money for the upfront capital. So if the US or Sweden or you know, whoever supplies the upfront money and then gets paid back over time, everybody comes out ahead. So I think that's really the role for the United States and other developed countries is technology and money. Could there also be some, some <coughs> sort of cap and trade system for this? Well, you know, methane is, is of course already in the, in the <coughs> European system and in the Kyoto Protocol. The problem with the current system, in my 
my view anyway, is that it only considers climate. So therefore, you know, your methane measure saves a lot of people's lives and improves agriculture, yeah, who cares? It's, it ha there's no value placed on that, which if your target is just to deal with climate, you know, that's fine, but if you have a more holistic view, then you would place more emphasis on that thing. So most of the CDM measures, you know, they've been funding a lot of things like CFC replacements because those have such an enormous GWP that they're really cost effective. They don't give you anything for health. And so I think that's not the optimum way to get this done. I think you could have a, an international trading system for methane. I don't think it would be a, a good idea to have one for the aerosols because, and, and for two reasons. One, because their impact is different everywhere. Um, so it's not obvious how you would trade them. But the other is that, you know, the more the, they're really so harmful to human health but then you're trading them to sort of economically save money and say, oh, well, it's better for me to, to control these pollutants here, and you people will all die, but you'll be saved because <laughs> I'll save some money that way. That doesn't really have a very nice ring to it. So I, I think the better way to go about controlling those is through <laughs> enhancing existing air quality uh, programs. So places like Mexico, you know, they're already working to improve their air quality. That can just be built up expanded, bring down the PM, especially with these kind of measures, and you get the air quality goals that they're aiming for, but you also get climate benefits. Okay, thanks for that.